All right, folks. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about precedence imaging. And before I show you how to do it, I need to first kind of demonstrate the concept. So what I need you to do is uh, get up out of your chairs, and I need you to stand perfectly centered between this left and right monitor speakers, OK? So we'll have like a little line there down the center of the room, OK? Perfectly centered. Off, off to the right by a foot will not work. So squish if you need to, but OK. So, so what I want you to do is close your eyes. Don't look at what I'm doing. I will let you see what I'm doing later. So you don't need to worry about peeking. I'm going to let you see it, OK? So uh, I, would, I want you to uh, tell me where you think the sound is coming from. And I want you to point to it. OK. OK, very good. So. Now let's try another way. It's in my face. The okay. water's incredibly clear. Okay, how about and how about now? I yeah. Okay. So uh, what at the, at the beginning, you were all pretty confident that it was coming from the left or the right. You can open your eyes for a second. Uh, you were all pretty confident it was coming from the left or the right, and you were all right. When, now, the second time, uh, you were less confident, but generally speaking, uh, you were pointing the direction that I thought you were. Okay. Um, what I'm doing here is I am panning, but I'm panning two different ways. So the first time I was panning by controlling volume, okay? So I was making one speaker louder than the other. And when the, whatever the louder one is, that's where you think it's coming from, okay? The second time, both loudspeakers were playing the same loudness the whole time. And what I was changing was the timing. So I was making, I was making one arrive at you later than the other one. And that was changing where you thought the sound was coming from. Okay, now, we're really good at figuring out where sound is coming from on this axis. Okay, our ears are mounted that way, and the phase relationships are really clear for us, and we've gotten really good at figuring that out. Um, my theory is that that's because most of the things that kill us tend to come at us from these directions. There's not very many things that kill us that tend to come from up above. So we've never learned to be very good at that. OK, uh, but we're really good at this. OK, but there's this other really interesting blind spot in our hearing system, which is this th idea of we are really not very good at determining, well, at he hearing multiple sounds as separate events when they are arriving out of time. OK, we're, we don't hear them as two different things. So before, when I was panning with time, you weren't as confident where the sound was coming from, but generally you were pointing the direction-ish based on where I was expecting you would for the, for the time panning. But uh, you also weren't necessarily noticing that you were hearing it twice. You just weren't as confident as, where, as to where it was coming from, but you, wouldn't, you weren't hearing an echo. Was it, or, or I don't know, was anybody hearing an echo? You know, no, I don't think so. Uh, so we're really bad at that. <laughs> we are really bad at hearing echoes in that kind of time window. And that's really, that's a very useful blind spot in our hearing system. Um, so here's the thing. So we know we are not very good at hearing those kind of echoes. We will glom them together as one thing. And it turns out that the way that we sort that out is when we hear two sounds coming at us at different times, 
As long as they're like outside of that like audible comb filtering window where it get the comb filtering is noticeable, you get that, that difference of time big enough and the comb filtering gets so bad that we ignore it. Um, at that point, your brain just sort of like gloms all the sounds together based on what arrived first. So whatever hit you first, then you think everything else is coming from there too, okay? So that's what was happening. So when I delayed the one on the right, you were hearing it twice, and you were hearing it 10 milliseconds different, okay? So the one on the left was hitting you 10 milliseconds before the one on the right, and you were generally feeling like that that sound was coming from the left, okay? Uh, but you weren't necessarily hearing it twice, okay? So the, we, that kind of just demonstrates that concept. Now we can flip both of these to our advantage. So we can take this idea of we're not very good at hearing delays like that, and we tend to just sort of glom it together with whatever arrives first, and we can couple that with this feature of our hearing, which is we're not very good at figuring out the difference between up and down. Um, we're not very good at that. Uh, so let me demonstrate that. I'm going to flip this now, and I want you to, uh, we're going to do the same exercise. So I'm going to flip it to the vertical. So I'm going to pan between the little one sitting on top of the subwoofer that's pointed up at you and the center one in, in the middle, okay? So I'm going to do the same exact thing. So I want you to close your eyes so you don't know what I'm doing. And I want you to tell me where you think the sound is coming from. Up, you know, where between the up and down, you know. Here you go. Where do you think it's coming from? Okay. Oh, hang on a second. I've lost my other side. How have I lost my other side? Did I not do this right? Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry. Try again. <laughs> Coming. Okay. Okay, very good. All right, so now I'm going to try it the other way. seeing it's interesting because I'm seeing a, some of you are sort of like oh yeah it's there but then some of you were like I don't actually know where it is I don't really know I can't decide isn't that interesting <laughs> turns out both were playing the same loudness and I was just manipulating time again so as I manipulated the time when it was the big loud one that was hitting you first, you were more confident, right? But when I flipped the timing and got the little one to hit you first, and then the big one hit you later, you were like, where's that coming from? And most of you were kind of like, mm, somewhere further down, but I'm not exactly sure where, but you weren't, none of you were going up there, even though that had never gotten any quieter. All I did was change the timing. Okay, but you were sort of like, I don't, I don't know, right? Isn't that interesting? Okay, now you come sit down. So this is called the precedence effect. This is called the precedence effect. And the idea behind the precedence effect is, you know, we will, we use the term imaging to describe this. Imaging is, in sound, is where do you think the sound is coming from? So we will image the sound to, towards whatever sound arrives first, okay? Uh, and we hear a sound, and if we hear a sound that comes later that sounds like the first one, sounds like the same thing, and, we, and it comes a little bit later, we will think that both sounds came from the thing that arrived first generally speaking. Uh, and that really works well when you're talking about like left to right, sideways kind of time manipulation. That's called the Hass effect, okay? 
Uh, but when you flip it on the vertical and you exploit this other blind spot in our hearing where we're not very good at, we're not as good at hearing the difference between up in the air and down on the floor, and you s add to that this delay thing, you're not super sure where the sound's coming from. Um, at that's the best case scenario. Well, worst case scenario is you're not really sure where it's coming from. Best case scenario is you think it's coming from the floor if the, the, thing, uh, if the thing on the floor is coming to you first. And some of you were doing that. Some of you were pointing to the floor. Some of you were like, oh, I don't know, but kind of in the middle maybe. Um, there are some rules of thumb for this though. So generally speaking, the difference in time needs to be at least five milliseconds because any less than that and it, the comb filtering is audible and you notice it more. But more than five milliseconds of difference in time and the comb filtering gets bad enough that you kind of ignore it. So that's the first rule is it needs to be five milliseconds or more in order for this to sound okay. And it really shouldn't be, it should be no more than 30 milliseconds. So once you hit 30 milliseconds, most people start hearing an echo. Some people will start hearing the echo sooner, um, but on average, most people will start hearing an echo at 30 milliseconds. So you wanna set this up so that the two sounds are arriving at the listener between five and 30 milliseconds apart from each other. Now, why would we wanna do this? Why would we care about this? Well, uh, generally speaking, for a lot of cases, it's weird for us, and this is one of the biggest criticisms that you know, we receive about modern sound reinforcement technology is that, well, just sound reinforcement technology in general, is that, well, it's like, yeah, okay, it's fine, I can hear it now, but it doesn't sound like it's coming from the place that I'm looking. I'm watching this person talk or I'm watching that instrument play and then it doesn't sound like it's coming from there. It sounds like it's coming from the big speakers up in the air or the speakers over to the side or something. It doesn't sound like it's coming from them. Uh, and a lot of people don't like that. Uh, and so there's been an enormous amount of work and research put in by a lot of people to kind of solve that problem. And there's lots of different ways to do it. The way that we're gonna talk about today is this idea of precedence. Because if we can s tweak the timing such that the thing that is making the sound that makes its own sound, i.e. the actor talking or singing um, or the instrument playing or whatever, if you can make sure that that natural sound from that thing hits your audience first and then the sound from your loudspeaker hits them within that five to 30 millisecond window, then you can trick your audience into thinking that that louder sound that come out of the loudspeaker actually came from the thing on stage, or, right? And that would be very cool. <laughs> Eric? So if the talker hits them first, then and, and then five to 30 milliseconds later, the sound from the loudspeaker hits them, you will think, on, most people will think all that sound came from the talker. But it will be louder. So it will sound like it came from the talker, but it's just gonna sound like the talker got louder. Isn't that interesting? And if you could pull that off, if you could make this louder so that everybody could hear and understand everything, and it still sounds like it all came from the people on the stage, you'd probably get paid pretty well for that show, right? Uh, there is another little rule of thumb, which is that the two sounds really can't be more than 10 dB apart in level for this to work. So if you're trying to make it louder, you would want that second sound that comes from the loudspeaker to arrive at the audience no more than 10 dB louder than the natural sound, than that first sound. So you can make a 10 dB difference here and have it still image pretty well. And part of, I, and so that's like something I was playing with for a half hour before you all came in here, was trying to get these two things balanced so that the big one was around the same loudness as the little one. Um, uh, or close, like within that 10 dB range. Uh, the other, yes? What, when it's more than 10 dB, you start to image towards the, the louder thing. 
even though the timing is different, right? So you, you wanna try to keep it within that 10 dB window if you can. Then you start to get a sense that the sound is coming from the louder thing, even though if the louder thing is later, right? The time effect stops working as well, okay? Um, there's a third rule about this, which is that both sounds need to sound the same. Okay, in every other way except for time and level. But aside from that, they have to sound the same. So like if it's a totally different sound, your brain will separate them. Like you can't do this trick with someone's voice and a guitar playing out of a speaker, right? Your brain is not gonna try to put those things together. So it has to sound, if it's a talker, the thing that's coming out of the last speaker has to sound like what's coming out of that talker. And ideally, it should sound really a lot like that in as many ways as you possibly can. So you want the frequency content to be the same. Um, that's the main thing is you want, and that's the where this particular experiment is struggling because the frequency response of that little Rankus Hines is very different from the frequency response of that JBL thing up in the, s in the sky. And so, I would need to do a little tuning to kind of like try to level those things out. And if I could do that, then you, all of you would lock right into the front fill every time, okay? That's why you're struggling a little bit on this one is because they don't sound exactly the same. And so your brain is kind of waffling, going, is this the same thing or is this not the same thing? I'm not sure. Um, and that's just because they sound different. Uh, so you gotta spend a lot of time EQing mics you know, to get what comes out of the loudspeakers to sound like what came out of the thing. And if you can do that, this will work. Uh, so, how do you figure this out? Because you ultimately have to design a sound system that will do this. And the first thing you have to do is you have to understand this other blind spot, which is that we really are not very good at hearing the difference between up in the air and down on the floor, okay? Um, I mean, within reason. I mean, if it's down on the floor ver in front of you versus up in the air here behind you, you'll hear the difference between that. But if it's, you know, uh, if it's a 15 to 30 degree difference between on the ground or up in the air, you know, you're gonna have a hard time. You're not as good at figuring that out. Um, and that's because the sound is hitting both of your ears at the same time at the same loudness, right, from the one thing. And so it's hard for you to kind of like figure out where that's coming from. So you gotta design the sound system in such a way that gets the loudspeakers positioned so that they are arriving at both ears at the same time. And we tend to do that by lining it up on whatever the center axis is of where they're looking. So if they're looking at the stage, and they tend to look at the, where their head is pointed towards the center of the stage, that's where you want your loudspeakers to be. You want them to be above and below that place where they're looking. Um, and you really don't have a lot of wiggle room left and right, because as you know, we're really sensitive to moving left and right. You move it even a foot left, and suddenly this thing is hitting this ear sooner than this ear, and you go, whoop, there. You're really good at that. So we really gotta keep it right on the center and that's worth fighting for um, because it really, even a foot breaks the trick sometimes, okay? Uh, unless you're really far away. If you're really far away, a foot is not gonna make it, but if you're you know, closer, it will. Uh, so that's the first thing, design the sound system. That's why we do center clusters and not left, right stacks, okay? Because we need to get it over the heads of where the audience is looking, okay? And then you gotta figure out the timing. So let's do that. And this is where we get into the assignment. So I'm going to, uh, this is just a draw section of view of the Stevens Center. So I'm gonna first uh, scale this. Actually, let me change the units first. I gotta get this into decimal units, decimal feet, because right now it's architectural inches. So let me scale it. Zero comma zero, one divided by 12. Okay, there we go. Yes. Okay, so we yeah. Okay, so the first thing you're going to do is units. 
units, and you want to change the type to decimals. Okay? And then you're going to scale. Scale, enter. Select objects, all, enter, enter. Specify the base point, which is doesn't really matter. I just usually type 0, 0. Enter. And then the scale factor. The scale factor is 1 12th, because we're trying to cram those 12 inches into one unit. So 1 divided by 12, enter. And there it is. And then I just zoom to get it back in. OK? All right. So here's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to put, I'm going to draw a little point here up from the floor about five feet. Whoa. <laughs> Let's uh, make that a little bit smaller. OK. And I'm going to, they're not going to stand right on the edge of the stage. They'll probably be, I'll just bring them back a little ways, a few feet. OK. So that's where the head is going to be of the talker. OK. And then I'm going to hang a loudspeaker. So I'm going to hang my own. So it'll be on a truss underneath this eyebrow. Um, so this little spot here is where the truss ends up. So I'm going to put a center cluster right there, directly above them. OK? And then I'm going to, I need to kind of like figure this out. We're going to, for the purposes of, um, well, no, we got to do all of them. So we're going to do, it'll take you forever to figure this out at every single seat. But if you can make it work at the front row and the back row, then it ought to work everywhere, on, everywhere in between. OK? So I'm going to do a point here at the front row of the orchestra level. Now this will be four feet up. And And I'm going to go ahead and just I want to turn my floor tracking off. I'm going to call this seat A. Actually, rotated like that. That's kind of weird. Let's try it. Let me try that again. Text. This file? Yeah. Where, what, is it, what do you mean, this file? Let's we'll look at it afterwards. Okay. So I'm going to call this seat A. Okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and just copy those two things using the floor as the base point. And I'm going to put another one back here at the floor of the back row. And then I'm going to put another one here at the floor of the front row balcony. And another one here at the back row balcony. Okay? And I'll call these A, B, C, D. I put it front row, back row. I'm just, to, when I copy them, I'm using the floor as the base point so that they're all the same height. Four feet, yeah. You know, that's just ish. That's about where I think their heads are going to be. All right, so to figure this out, I first need to know uh, how far away they are from each of these things. So this is where Excel is going to come in really handy. So I'm going to say this will be seat A, seat B, seat C. And let's see, let's go a bit bigger. Uh, 
seat D. And this is going to be just straight up distance. So I'm just going to start measuring. Uh, this will be talker distance. It'll be talker first. So I'm going to measure here to here. And I got 22.2822. Okay. And then let's go to seat B. 81.1344. And then I'll go to seat C. 65.1757. Um, back row is 104.588. Okay, that's the distance quick measurements. I want to convert that to time. How long does it take the sound to get to that spot by traveling that distance? So how do I, what's the math I use to go from distance to time? Close. Um, yeah, we want milliseconds. So yes, you want to divide by 1.13. So I'm going to just use this formula to say equals, and I'll say that cell divided by 1.13. And I will get a value in milliseconds. Milliseconds because that's usually what you can dial in on a delay processor. It doesn't usually do it in seconds. Um, and then I can just drag that formula across to the other four cells, and it will automatically calculate it. So it takes 19 milliseconds for the talker to get to, s to the front row orchestra, 70, almost 72 milliseconds for the sound from the talker to get to the back row orchestra. It takes 57 and a half milliseconds to get to the front row balcony and 92 and a half milliseconds to get to the back row balcony. Okay, that's just how long it takes in time. So now I want to, I want to do uh, my loudspeaker distance. So let's measure the distance of the loudspeaker to each of those seats. So let's see, to the front row, seat A, it is 33 point one nine feet to the back row is seventy six point eight zero four three two seat C it is fifty three point nine six eight six And to the seat D is 91.2266. All right, that's just the distance. And now I want to do the LS time. How long will it take to do that? It's the exact same equation. So I'll do equals that distance divided by 1.13. And I get time, and I'll copy that over. So now I've got the times. I have the time it takes for the talker to arrive at each seat and the time it takes for the loudspeaker to arrive at each seat. And now what I need to find out is the difference. What is the difference in time? Say again. No, 
because you want the talker to arrive first, right? That's what you want. And so you, if the talker was arriving first, then you should be able to do the, the talker time minus, no, the, the, you should be able to do the loudspeaker time minus the talker time, and you should get a positive number, right? Loudspeaker minus talker, you should get a positive number. And if you get a positive number, then you know that the talker arrived first. If you get a negative number, you know the loudspeaker arrived first. So we're going to do, uh, this will be ls minus talker. So we're, that's going to be loudspeaker time minus talker time. And I will get the difference in time. So in this case, at seat A, the talker arrives 9.65 milliseconds sooner than the loudspeaker. And that would make a, some sense, right? Because it's closer. The talker only has to travel 19 milliseconds to get to seat A, whereas the loudspeaker has to travel 29 milliseconds to get to seat A. So the talker's gonna arrive first just because it's closer. You see how that works? Everybody with me? Okay. Now, if I copy this equation over, I'll see the difference. Oh, look, I've got negative numbers in, at every other seat, which means at the other three seats, the loudspeaker is arriving first because it's closer. It's physically closer to those seats. Okay? So here's what I'd like to know. How much delay, assuming I could build a machine that would allow me to slow down <laughs> that loudspeaker, make it make the sound come out later, delay it, in other words. How much delay would I need to add to the loudspeaker for all of the all four of these numbers to become a positive number that was at least five but less than thirty? How much delay would I need to add to make all those numbers do that? Okay, Seth says 17. Let's find out. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the loudspeaker delay to that. So I'm going to do, the formula now is loudspeaker minus talker plus the loudspeaker delay. And now that front row turns into 26 and a half milliseconds. Now if I drag this out, oops, if I copy this over, wait a minute. Oh, hang on, I gotta, I gotta make this not increment. So I'm gonna have to put the little dollar sign in front of the H and the two so it doesn't shift. There we go. Okay, see that? So now, yes, all the numbers are greater than five, but less than 30. And when you say delay is five, is that just the number of the So that's just how Excel works, mm -hmm. is when you copy a formula, it will automatically increment all the cell values based on how far you okay. offset it. But if you don't want, if there's a cell value you don't want to have change, you put dollar signs before okay. both of the, you know, the, the letter and the number, uh, and then those won't change. That's what Seth said. Okay. I just put the number in Seth said. No, that's not what happened. What happened was, as I said, we were here, and we had these four numbers, and I said, how much delay would I have to add to the loudspeaker to make all four of those numbers be more than five but less than 30? So, I mean, could you just keep going with the number of the numbers and then add the extra one? I don't know. Let's find out. You think 12? 12 does not work because now this number and this number are less than five. Well, if I add the extra one, then it would work. Yes? Don't 
Don't think about it in, stop thinking about Excel. I'm not trying to teach you Excel right now. The Excel part will come later. What I need you to understand is what is the math we are doing? And the math we are doing is we are taking the loudspeaker time minus the talker time. And then we are adding the loudspeaker delay because that becomes part of the loudspeaker time, right? So it is loudspeaker time minus talker time plus the loudspeaker delay. That's the math. The formula in Excel will depend on where you put your data, right? Um, the thing I need you to remember today is not how Excel works. You can do this without Excel. I'm just using Excel to keep track of the numbers. What I need you to remember and understand is the math we are doing. Okay, so don't let the Excel part distract you. Okay, so, uh, so y no, Eric, 12 will not work, right? Because now I don't have a number greater than five and less than 30. But yes, if I, somebody said 16, 16 does not quite get us there, right? Because seat D is only four milliseconds. But if I do 17, then it works. And I don't have a whole lot of wiggle room here, right? I mean, I could go to 18, I mean, if I take it to 20, I'm getting awfully close to 30 there, and I really don't want to be there. So, yeah, 17 is about right. Okay, great. Solved. And that wasn't so hard. Because uh, I am. It's not solved. Because there is a very specific uh, problem with the scenario we have set up. Can anyone think of it? Well, there's that. We are, we're not getting into that yet, but we're, we'll assume that we can get the gain we need. But what is the problem with this scenario? Yeah, that little dot is not going to stay there. It's going to move, right? It's going to move all the time. And what happens when it moves? The time changes. And I only have about three milliseconds of wiggle room, which means I only have about three feet of wiggle room. They can walk around in a radius of three and a half feet from the spot, that, and that's it. Once they go out of that radius, this stops working. Either somebody hears an echo or somebody hears the loudspeaker first. Okay. So, yeah, that's not, I mean, that's not going to fly, right? I can't, I mean, that would be lovely, right, if I could just get them to stand still. And if this was like, you know, uh, a lecture hall where people just stood at a podium and, and talked, then fine. But it was, this is not that. This is a theater where they put people on the stage and they move them around, okay? So uh, we have to get them, we have to figure out how to do this in a way that allows those talkers to move around and have it still work. Okay. Well, here's the thing. We know it works if they stand still, right? Because we just proved it. It works if they stand still. Uh, so what I need to do, if I can't get them to stand still, then I need to create a sound that is right next to them that stands still. <laughs> and there's, uh, there's actually, there's this uh, opera company, I believe it was in Germany, that they do operas, uh, they put the stage, it's on the beach, and they do the opera on this floating stage out on the water, and it's really far away. And, uh, and this, this <laughs> the person that does the sound for that literally embeds speakers all over in the set, and depending on where they stand, like they're all like motorized, and they'll stop and stand here to sing their little song, and you'll see a little speaker go, Right, <laughs> out of the floor, right where they're standing, so they can kind of like move around in that like two or three feet kind of thing. And there's the speaker right next to them, <laughs> and they're far enough away that you don't notice it so much. But uh, but that's what that's what they do. <laughs> uh, that's not super practical. I mean, you gotta got a lot of money, and you gotta be really far away for that for that to fly with the pretty committee. Um, but it 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 happens. Uh, 
And uh, so we're not going to do that. But we could put a loudspeaker somewhere near them. OK, we could put something on the stage. Uh, let's try it. So what if I put something right there, just right on the edge of the stage? Pretty close to them. And uh, we'll have that be my loudspeaker instead of it being up in the air. And let's see if it works any better. OK, so, in, let's, so we're going to measure new distances now. So for, this is my loudspeaker now. The seat A is 16.5795. So 16.9795. OK, and then to seat B is 76.4509. And the seat C is 62.5568. And to seat D is 101.9431. And let's get rid of the delay for a sec. OK, so look at this. What do you notice about these numbers compared to the numbers we had before? They're a lot closer together. Lot closer together. Why? Because the loudspeaker is right next to the actor. And so of course it's going to arrive around the same time as the actor, right? It's also a little bit in front of the actor, and therefore, of course, it's going to arrive first. So that's why we've got negative numbers. So they are all negative numbers, but they are also within two milliseconds of each other because it's right next to them. OK, so uh, that means I've now got a lot more wiggle room for my actor to move around. OK, they could move and, you know, because really I'm looking for five to 30 milliseconds is what I'm looking for. And I've got room. They could move around, and, and that could still work. So what I want to do is uh, let's, uh, let's figure out where we want them to move. So first, I'm going to move this one. So where's the farthest downstage you think they're ever going to go? Well, they're not going to stand right on the edge of the stage. That's scary. So maybe like there is about as far as they're ever going to go. OK? And Let's figure out a spot upstage, which would be kind of like the upper limits of where we think they're going to go. Um, so what is the difference between 5 and 30? 25. So I, that's my theoretical range here for them. I'm going to say I'm going to shorten that to 20 just to make sure I'm, you know, I've got give or take a foot or two for them, okay? So I'm going to say 20 feet. So this is about a foot per millisecond. So I'm going to give them an area of about 20 feet, upstage to downstage, where they can move around. And let's see if that works. So I'm going to make a copy of this 20 feet there. Oh, look how far away that is. Yeah? It's a pretty big area. Okay. So now we're going to change this. So this is going to become the downstage talker distance. And this will be the downstage talker time. And now I'm going to insert a couple more cells here. And I'm going to do an upstage talker distance and an upstage talker time. And I'm going to figure this out for both locations, when they're, when they're downstage versus upstage. And if I can get it to work in both places, then it should work everywhere in between. OK? So uh, let's do it. So I'm going to re-measure the first one, which is the downstage. So we're going to go, this will be 19.0621. To seat B downstage, to seat B is 77.845. Um, to 
seat C is 62.1336. Okay, um, and to seat D is 101.5626. Um, well, I haven't got there yet, okay. so hang on there, because okay. the math is going to be a little bit different now. All I'm doing right now is measuring the distances between these new places that I have, okay? Now this one, the, the conversion to time should be the same, right? Because it's still just doing the same cell. So let's now do the, t the upstage distance. So from the upstage spot, I'm going to go to seat A, which is 38.8052. And to seat B is 97.791. To seat C is 80.8812. Um, to seat D is 120.1202. Okay, that's the distance. I need to convert this to time in milliseconds. And how do we do that? Uh, 120. Good catch, Lee. I gotta do what? Exactly. So I'm gonna take that distance divided by 1.13. And that gives me the time. Okay, and I'm gonna copy that over. Okay, now just to kind of like start helping me out here, I'm gonna start shading some of these rows. So the ones that I'm interested in, I'm gonna shade in green, because I'm interested in the time values. Okay, so those are the differences of time or the, 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 the time values for those things. Now, um, the last figure is in the same place, and therefore uh, this thing, which is used to be loudspeaker minus talker, is now just downstage minus talker, okay? And now I wanna do, and this is where I'm gonna get to your question. Uh, so now I have to add some new math, which is now I have to do that same thing for the upstage location. So now I've got to do the, uh, or sorry, this is going to be LS minus downstage. Because for the loudspeaker minus the downstage talker. And now I need to do loudspeaker minus the upstage talker. So we'll do the loudspeaker time minus the upstage talker time. And I'll go ahead and add the, the last speaker delay to that, because eventually I'm going to delay this. And I'll go ahead and tell it cell to hang on to that value. I'll put the dollar signs in front of it. And then I'll copy those over. OK, so here I've got, let's put these in blue. Oops, not that one. So these blue ones, the first row are within a couple milliseconds of each other, right? And the bottom four are within, well, about four milliseconds of each other, three milliseconds of each other, okay? So what is the amount of delay I would need to put on the loudspeaker in order for all eight of those numbers to be greater than five but less than 30? What was it? Five milliseconds? Nope. Doesn't quite get us there. Okay. 
Okay. Eric says 25. Uh, that works. Lowest thing is five and a half. Highest thing is 25 and, and 0.3. So 25 milliseconds does it. Um, so they can walk around anywhere within that 20 feet area upstage to downstage. And this will work now. And all I did was just put the last speaker on the floor right next to them. But what's the, prob what's the new problem we've now made for ourselves by putting the loudspeaker right next to them? Now we have a new problem. Yeah, but we, we fixed that with delay, okay. right? What's the other problem we're having? Yeah, it is different, but that's okay because it's still within the window where it works, right? There it is. We just put the loudspeaker a lot closer to the microphones. A lot closer. And what happens when you do that? Your your gain goes down. You have you're going to have feedback e more more. So, you don't want that. <laughs> so, you can make the timing work, but you're never going to be able to make that uh, loudspeaker be very loud. You're going to have very little gain there because it's so close to the mics, right? So uh, it turns out, here's the good news. It turns out that this effect, this precedence effect, stacks. And what I mean by that is I could, in, instead of just hearing two sounds, I could hear three sounds. And so I hear the first sound, and then five to 30 milliseconds later, I hear the next sound, and I would think that both of those sounds came from the first thing. The third sound could come five to 30 milliseconds after the second sound, which that could be as much as 60 milliseconds after the first one, which would normally be an echo. But if it's within five to 30 milliseconds of the second sound, then the third sound images to the second sound and the second sound images to the first sound and therefore, your brain thinks all three of them came from the thing, the first sound, the thing that arose first. And you can chain that forever. There's no end to how many times your brain will, will hop that. Okay? So you could have it 20 times. And the 20th sound images to the 19th, the 19th images to the 18th, the 18th images to the 17th, so on and so forth, all the way back to the first arrival, which is the talker. Right, and that's why this works. The reason we have this blind spot is because we hear multiple copies of a sound all the time, because sound reflects off of things. So everywhere we go, we're hearing a sound many, many times. At, uh, and so we've gotten really good at making sense out of that. So we're exploiting that here. Uh, so we can have that little loudspeaker on the stage, and it doesn't have to be very loud. In fact, it doesn't really have to be any louder than the talkers. So we, don't, we need very little gain on that thing. We could get away with zero gain, and it would still do its job. OK? Uh, as long as it's not negative gain. <laughs> But zero gain is okay. So great. And then all we do is we get a big loudspeaker and we put it farther away from the stage and it makes all the loud st stuff and it has the gain before feedback. Uh, and so we're gonna go back now to our loudspeaker that's up in the air. Yeah. So we're gonna go back to this loudspeaker up in the air. We know that this will work as long as the actor doesn't move. Yes. So we're, instead of trying to image this to the actor that's gonna move, we're gonna image it to the loudspeaker on the floor that we know doesn't move, and we already know that works. So we're gonna image the big thing up in the air 
to the little thing on the floor, and the little thing on the floor images to the actor that's moving around, and now they, the audience is hearing three things, and they think it's all coming from the actor. Okay? Let's try it. Are you ready? So now I'm going to do. Uh, so we're going to call. We're going to change LS to FF for front fill because that's what we tend to call these. But hopefully, what you're understanding now is that the front fill has very little to do with filling in the front. That's not actually what we use it for. It's not because we need the front two rows to hear better. We actually need the entire theater to hear those and hear them pretty well, right, in order for this to work. So calling them front fills is a bit of a confusing term, but it's the one we use nonetheless. Some people call them imaging fills, but that, that term is yet to really catch on. But if you talk to people from D&B, that's what they call them, imaging fills, because that makes a bit more sense, I guess. But it's not a term that's caught on. Uh, so, and then we're going to call the one up in the air the CC, the center cluster. So we'll do a center cluster distance and a center cluster time. So let's go back, and we should have kept these values, but oh well. We'll measure them again. We'll take that one. So center cluster to front row seat A is 33.19 feet. Center cluster to seat B is 76.8043. And center cluster to seat C is 53.9686. And center cluster to seat D is 91.2266. And now I have to convert that to time which I do by taking the distance divided by 1.13, and I get time. All right, so now I have to image this to the front fill. So this is going to be center cluster minus front fill. And I'm gonna probably have to delay that center cluster so center cluster delay will go here. So this is going to be center cluster minus front fill. So center cluster time minus front fill time. But the front fill has been delayed, hasn't it? So I need to also subtract the front fill delay. Okay, and I will go ahead and make sure it doesn't change that delay value. Okay, so I'll drag this over now. Now here, there's the le the magnitude of problem I have here. So I've got a range of negative 10 milliseconds versus negative 34 milliseconds. Why? Because the center cluster is arriving first. Why? Because I have 25 milliseconds of delay on the front fill. Okay. Center cluster minus front fill. Center cluster time minus the front fill time. And the front fill time includes the, del the front fill delay. So center cluster time minus front fill time minus front fill delay. Okay. So. Here's what I'm going to do. I want to delay this center cluster so that these become positive numbers, right? Because right now they're negative numbers, which means the center cluster is arriving first. But I need the center cluster to arrive after the front fills. Okay? So I'm going to modify this math. So it's going to be the center cluster time plus the center cluster delay. We'll do that. Because ultimately, that'll be the total time, is the actual time plus the delay that I add, 
that'll be the total time, and then I'm going to subtract the front fill time and the front fill delay. So this is center cluster time plus center cluster delay minus front fill time minus front fill delay. Center cluster time plus center cluster delay minus front fill time minus front fill delay. The difference between the center cluster and the front fill. Okay? So, let me now drag that over. So, let's, how much delay would I need to add here? Well, it looks like at least 40, right? 40 milliseconds. If I put 40 milliseconds of delay on that center cluster, I get numbers between 5 and 30. Barely. <laughs> I have zero wiggle room here. But that's okay. The front fill is never going to move. So, and the center cluster is never going to move. So who cares? And you know what? The audience moves. But we know that as long as they're on the center line, then it works, right? But guess what? If they move, if we do the sound system in such a way that all those loudspeakers are directly over the center of the stage, then even if they move three rows or three seats to the left, the distance is the same. The relative time between those two loudspeakers, isn't it? So even though the audience moves, as long as they move horizontally and as long as we have the loudspeakers lined up vertically over the center of the stage, then the center of the stage becomes the axis of that arc, doesn't it? And therefore they can move left, the audience can move left to right and this relative time will stay more or less intact, right? This is why it's so important for you to get these loudspeakers lined up on that center. And you've got to fight hard for that, because if you if you start putting them over to the side, then this time trick collapses. Okay, but we did it. Now here's what now the rest of the problem now would be designing the sound system in such a way that we can deliver as close as possible to equal loudness to every seat from the front fill and equal loudness to every seat from the center cluster. So we want every seat to hear each of those loudspeakers at the same level, depending, no matter where they sit. It's going to be pretty hard for the front fill, okay? Because th you're dealing with vastly different distances and angles here, okay? So you can't, directivity is not going to help you too much. The one thing you can do here, well, there's two things you can do, is Get the front fills far away from the front row. And this is where you got to really help the pretty committee understand this. Because y you're going to say, I need front fills. Well, they're going to say, great. Well, just put them right here on, like in the Friedman, for example. They'll say, just put them on the bottom step. And they're right there next to the front row. They'll hear great. It's like, yeah, but they're only like a foot away from the front row. Which means by the time I get to the second row, they're 6 dB quieter. And by the time I get to the fourth row, they're 12 dB quieter. And they're now they're useless. <laughs> but if you can get them farther away, let's say the front fills are 10 feet away from the front row. Then by the time you get to, you know, how far apart are the rows? A couple of feet. So you could get 10 rows back before it drops 6 dB. 20 rows back, and it's only dropped 12 dB. Now that's the end, that's probably the end of the theater at that point. Okay. So you want to get those front fills far away from that front row, and that's not going to make sense to people who don't do sound, because you're going to call them front fills, and they're going to say, "Yeah, but why do they have to be so far away from the front row? Don't you know how to do this?" And you're like, "Yes, I do," but 
I am trying to do more th than just help those people in that front row, okay? So that's where this is really helping. Having an orchestra pit is the most wonderful thing because it gives you this built-in ability to get some distance <laughs> between your front fills and the front rows because there's usually this big orchestra pit in the middle. And so you just shoot the front fills across the orchestra pit and that gets you that distance. So that's the first trick to getting the front fills to distribute evenly across the audience area. The second trick is you aim them up away from the front row. So you, if you aim them up towards the back row and the front row is looking at them off axis, then you get that 6 dB trick where they are closer to the front fills on the front row and therefore they are louder, but you've pointed them up and therefore the loudspeaker is quieter because of directivity. So it kind of evens out. And then in the back, it's traveling farther, and therefore it gets quieter, but they're also on axis and therefore it's louder. So <laughs> it evens out a little bit. So you can't make it, you're never gonna get a range of 6 dB across the whole audience from the front fills. You're never gonna get that. But hopefully you can get it within 12, if you can. But you want it as even as you possibly can, all right? Uh, then for the center cluster, it's all the things we've already talked about, right? It's leveraging directivity, figuring out the angles, and getting that to distribute evenly. And that way, you can get that 10 dB hop. Because in the best case scenario, the front fills arrive at the listeners 10 dB louder than the talker and the center cluster arrives at the listeners 10 dB louder than the front fill, which is a total of 20 dB of gain, which means the show sounds 20 dB louder because you showed up and did your job. Uh, and 20 dB louder is a lot. So it's 20 dB louder, and it all sounds like it's coming from that actor standing on the stage. I was expecting you to be more impressed, but... Yes, okay. <laughs> Questions, yes. I've now completed the demonstration. Yeah. So for front fills, you're just doing front fills minus the talker. Well, and the delay, yeah, okay. and the delay. So front fill time plus front fill delay minus the talker. To the ears of the listeners, yes, to the seats. You solve this from the point of view of the listener. Yes, Eric. Yeah. So I want you to, you doesn't have to be exactly this. You don't have to use Excel and you don't have to do all the fancy formulas. You can do this on paper with a pencil if you want to. I you just need the data. You just need to, you, you, I'm measuring a ton of things here, right? And you can't keep them all in your head. You'll lose them, okay? I remember things really well, but I would not remember all those numbers, okay? So you just have to like write them down. You can write them down on a piece of paper. You can type them into you know, a sticky note on your computer, you can use Excel, you can do whatever, but you just have to write them down somewhere <laughs> so that you can then do the math on them. And you write down the math. Now, if, you, if the Excel thing helps you and makes sense to you and that's great, then you can absolutely do that and you can have Excel do the math for you and then I can see the math you did. If you decide to just do this all freehand, that's fine, just make sure you, you document your math, right? You just write out. And here, I took the front fill time minus the talker time, and that equals this. And then I could check your math to make sure that it was right, okay? So, yeah. That's for the, you know, that is for the figuring out the difference between the talker and the first loudspeaker, which is probably going to be the front fill. Okay. 
Yeah, whatever the loudspeaker is that you want to arrive first. Okay. And then you're going to have another loudspeaker, right? Which in this case is the center cluster. And once you've got that front fill or that first loudspeaker time aligned to the talker, then you can ignore the talker now. You don't have to worry about that now. You just have to worry about the center cluster relative to the front fill. So that is, so you take this, yeah, you take the center, center cluster time plus the center cluster delay minus the front fill time minus the front fill delay. What's that? Yeah. But here's the thing. You could have more than just two loudspeakers. And in fact, the grad students, you will in your assignments. You are going to have four different loudspeaker locations. Okay? And so, but the same principle applies. So you're going to first image the front fills to the talkers. And then you're going to image the center cluster to the front fills. And then you're going to image the delay fills to the center cluster. Okay? So you're going to have balcony fills and under balcony fills in your file. And you, you get these in reverse. You tr you're trying to get these things to happen in reverse order. Okay? Because usually the talker will be the farthest thing away. And, and the under balcony fill will be the closest thing away. And you want to flip that. <laughs> so but it's, so it, you just keep adding these chains. And you would, so the balcony fill, you would compare that against the center cluster. And the under, under balcony fill, you would compare against the center cluster. Okay? Yes? Yep. There are, aren't there? Well, it depends. Um, it depends. Try it and see. If you can make it work as one thing, then great. If you can't make it work as one thing, then you might need to treat them separately. But keep in mind that just because you treat them separately doesn't mean that you that everyone won't hear them. In other words, like. So in your in your one, let me show you the one the file you have. <laughs> so you have not directivity. We want the precedence imaging. Here it is. So yeah, there it is. Okay. So uh, you've got this center cluster, okay? So you if you could make this work as though it's one thing, uh, then great. <laughs> uh, you have to just sort of like think about what the acoustic center of this thing would be and, and pick a point in the middle of those three and use that. Because these are all going to be aligned so that they are arriving. Yeah, they're acting as one. Okay. Yeah, but if you can't make that work, then you might need to treat them separately. For example, you might need to treat the top two as one thing and the bottom one as a separate thing. But keep in mind that just because the bottom one is a separate thing and that it's only pointed down here doesn't mean the people in the balcony won't hear it. So you do have to get the timing to work, just like everything else. Yeah. You could try that. So you're talking about doing something like this. Yeah, pretty close.
I'll give you a hint. This downfill is going to have some extra delay on it. Okay? Because because you looked in the app, right? So in real life, this has about an extra five milliseconds of delay on it, okay? Not quite five, like four or something, right? But that's, it's because these tend to arrive together and this is really close. So you can, you can effectively use the center one as your location, okay? Because this bottom one's gonna be delayed to arrive there. Start there, well, start with front fills and then try to figure this out. And I would see if you can make it work using the center of that, the center box, and just see what happens. That 0.3 milliseconds is just the inherent latency of the amplifier. Uh, so see if you can make that work. And if you can't make that work, then you might need to treat those things as two separate things. But it's the same process. So you just do figure out the front fills, and then you take the next closest loudspeaker, which would be the down fill, and you make it work, make that work for every seat, and then you treat the top two as another arrival that would come later, and then you treat the balcony fills and the underbalcony fills as separate arrivals. So it, the process is the same. You just, instead of treating them as one thing, you treat them as two things. So this is more like a four-minute Well, that would be lovely. I'm saying that might not work. You might not. You might have a hard time oh, making that work. So you're saying this file would be like very short. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> or six, depending on how you loop. I mean, you got to figure it out. I have to give you guys something harder, so I'm giving you something harder. You have to figure out a, a higher level concept here. Okay. Brilliant. All right, folks. Any other questions?